Well, good morning. We woke up to a nice rain watering the yard and watering the gardens, which means later this week you have to pick the weeds and mow the grass. Praise be to God. Um, Let's begin with um, a, a time of quiet as we center ourselves Uh, on the joy of God, and then I'll offer a prayer and we'll get underway. Okay, so let's take a, a few minutes or a moment, I should say, of quiet. Joyful God, we delight together today in your presence and in the presence of others. And so we pray for the church that we may find our identity and our relationship with God instead of in the allurements of possessions, accomplishments, or power. We pray for a strengthening of our discipleship that we may hear God's invitation to bring forth the reign of God in our lives, our work, and our relationships. We pray for a deepening of gratitude that we may recognize and appreciate all the gifts that God has given us and honor God by utilizing them fully for God's glory. We pray for the grace to travel lightly, that God will show us how to live the reign of God through vulnerability, reliance on one another, and journeying with Christ. And so we also pray for our companions on the journey of faith, that we may be faithful witnesses with our family, friends, co-workers, and fellow parishioners to the work of God in one another's lives. We also pray for those who are suffering, that God will assist those recovering from storms, protect those who live amidst violence, guide those who are looking for work, and comfort all who are grieving. And we pray for all who are sick, that God's healing love will restore the sick, strengthening those recovering from surgery, and continue to work through us to help stop the spread of the pandemic. Eternal God, grant that we may seek with joy the way of your love for us and for the world. We pray this through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. So I have a bit of scripture to frame our conversation today. Uh, It is from the Gospel of Matthew, uh, which you're familiar with. Uh, It's one of my favorites because I have the same name, of course. Um. (laughs) That's a joke. They named it after me. Good morning. (laughs) So you're familiar with the Sermon on the Mount, uh, I imagine. And the Sermon on the Mount continues on for a while. Uh, Jesus uh, uh, got on a roll and held forth. Um, And, you know, after the the famous uh, parts of the Sermon on the Mount that we remember well, uh, Jesus somewhat turns into the, the wise rabbi, uh, speaking in short sayings that are easy to remember. Um, and here, there's a series of them here that uh, begin in chapter 6. Uh, we'll start in verse 25. Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, Or about your body, what you will wear? Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. 
Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field which is alive today and tomorrow and is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things. And indeed, your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, And all these things will be given to you as well. So, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. All right, today we're going to talk about joy. Joy. Uh, We have a hymn that we sing after Christmas, uh, and you know, if you have a, a Christmas Day service or Mass, it's typically sung there, joy to the world, the Lord has come. So we're going to investigate joy, joyfully and hopefully. What does joy look like in the context of hope? Mm-hmm. Of course, if you'll recall, uh, hope is the overall theme and scope of what we've been talking about this summer. Uh, And so, in order to talk effectively about joy, I've invited to join us today one of the most joyful people that I know. (laughs) This is Mary Katie Bolin, right here. Um, A brief biography of her, she was born and raised in East Tennessee and has been a Tennessee girl all her life. After a happy childhood in Chattanooga, she moved to Nashville and attended Vanderbilt University twice, uh, getting a BA and an MDiv from Vanderbilt Divinity School. She later married a Nashville native, Brian, there he is, right there, and has been a member of the rich tapestry of Middle Tennessee ever since. In 2013, she started preaching at Camp DeSoto. Is that in Mentone? Mentone, Alabama. Mentone, Alabama? Mm -hmm. And it was evident that she had a talent for capturing the hearts of the women and girls in attendance. And she relishes the opportunity to connect and meet women and girls where they are, whether it's talk on self-care, scripture, relationships, family, or anything in between. And so I'd add to that joy. (laughs) Um, So Mary Katie is uh, the director of children's ministry at uh, Church of the Redeemer in Oak Hill and also is a much-beloved instructor at the Green Hills YMCA. Um, in fact, so much beloved that some of those folks came out on Sunday morning to hear her talk about <laughs> joy. So uh, will you welcome today Mary Katie Bolin. Yay! <clears throat> and so, um, as is typical of how I've been doing this, I'm going to throw out a very easy question to you, Mary Katie, and that is... What is joy? I like it. You lead with the softball. (laughs) Um, So Matt threw that question out to me a week and a half ago over lunch, and I just kind of sat there and looked at him. (laughs) Um, He said, you're supposed to be joyful. You're supposed to know what this is. And over time, where I ended up is that joy is a choice in reaction to what we have all been given in Mm -hmm. life. Um, I think all of us, whether you're watching at home or online or in Sunday school classes or right here, have not been given um, possibly the most perfect childhood or the most perfect adulthood. And so joy is what you do and what you find. It's the choice you make in the face of that adversity. Mm -hmm. That's kind of where we landed. So joy is a choice. Yes. Uh, so it's like just sitting there? No. So, um, you know, I... How do I, I choose it? I joked around with Matt that I was going to stand up and say there were five easy steps to obtain joy. 
<laughs> and we were all going to do them together. What and by the time joy? you left at 1030, you too would have joy. Um, <laughs> we're, we're not going to do that. But I do think in the face of adversity, we have a lot of options. Um, not an unlimited amount of options, but I think we have several key options, and we know people who've chosen different options. So in the face of certain trials, or as I said, adversity, you could choose fear. You know, you could choose anger. You could choose sadness. Um, you could choose any myriad of other emotions, but joy is a choice mm -hmm. that is also available to you in those times. And it doesn't mean that you don't experience the other emotions because that would be irresponsible, right? To not experience sadness in the midst of loss or anger in the midst of deep misfortune. But joy is where we should aim to end up yeah. and not get stuck. So you mentioned yeah, as we were driving over this morning about mm. the, the movie Inside Out. Anybody yeah. you see, seen the movie yeah. Inside Out? The children's pastor has to mention a cartoon, right? Well, like. I mentioned it, <laughs> just to be fair. Okay, thank you. Uh, but it, is, it has been noted as a, a fantastic way to, for, mm -hmm. for children especially um, to begin to think about the types of emotions and feelings that they're mm -hmm. having. Right. Um, and so, you know, I've noted my favorite character in there is uh, anger. Yeah. You know, Lewis Black is anger. I mean, if you know Lewis Black's comedy at all, you know it's a perfect fit. Mm -hmm. uh, but these, the emotions have, uh, they have bodily form. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they take action. It's brilliant. Um, and so, I mean, this, this child in, in, the, mm -hmm. in the movie is experiencing all of these emotions. Sure. And you can see them working in the background, mm -hmm. kind of negotiating which emotion is going to be present today. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so, I mean, just thinking about a, a film like that, if you're talking with children, for instance, right. and they are saying, Mary Katie, what's, how do I be happy? Mm -hmm. How do I be joyful? Mm -hmm. What do you say? I say, you know, you just got to straighten up and fly Straight, right. Straighten up and fly That's right? That's it. Yeah. I mean, no, just kidding. <laughs> um, I think it's really common for yeah. us to put joy on one side of the emotional spectrum maybe, and then put all the other ones away and not allow them to interplay. Um, and so I think it's really important, especially in dealing with children, that we don't vilify certain emotions, that we don't vilify the sadness or the fear or the anger, but that we try to figure out a way to work within that and circle back to joy, that there's a place we want to land so we can be sad and we can be angry and we can be disgusted mm -hmm. or whatever else, and we can own that. But we don't want to sit there for the long term. We want to circle back into something else. So would you say that um, joy is, is a, a preferred landing spot? Yeah. Um, why? I Absolutely. Mean, why would that be better than why wallowing in sadness? <laughs> than, than being perpetually <clears throat> I mean, if that's not a time. way to position a question. <laughs> Um, you know, I talk a lot about, if, if you know me pretty well, you know I talk a lot about my aerobics classes at the Y, and they are full of some older adults, so I teach active older adults, and um, they're in their 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and there is a marked difference between the way that people in that class interact. I mean, it is, it is so stark to me that as we get older, we get set in emotions, and we get set into patterns. And, and there is just a richness that is so evident, it's almost palpable, with the ones who have chosen to live a life full of joy. And no matter what, again, no matter what they've dealt, there is a lightness, um, there is an optimism. And when we talk about theologies of hope, you know, we talked about this, this greater, this greater uh, theme that you're working with this summer, that joy is a good place to kind of land as we wait for what's more. Oh, yeah. You know, right? We talked about that. It's yeah. a good place to keep watch. Yeah, Better we're going to come back to that notion yeah. of keeping watch okay. uh, in, a, in a little bit because um, I think that's a nice way to, to frame joy in a, a theological uh, setting. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so we met yesterday, Mary Katie and I, to kind of go over what we were talking about today. We had this keen idea, let's ask the server what she thinks joy is. And so that's what we did. Yes. <laughs> and great. her name was? Bailey. Bailey. We asked yeah. Bailey, Bailey, what is joy? And she looked at us for a minute, really confounded. Yeah. I think she you know, was I think, I think she was unnerved. thinking, do we have that on the menu? <laughs> I'm not familiar with that on the menu. <laughs> and 
you know, we said we're just, you know, we're asking ourselves, you know, to describe and define joy mm. and just wondered how you would describe and define it. Mm. And she said, let me think about it. It's great. Yeah. So she went away. We didn't think she was going to come back. <laughs> <laughs> but she did. What'd she say? She said joy was freedom. And we um, both said, well, tell us more about that, Bailey. And she <laughs> said, <laughs> she said, when I leave work, maybe I don't have to work the rest of the day, and I roll the windows down, and I can drive home, and that's joy to me. And that was really, it was very sweet. And that was, mm -hmm. I think, where her heart really landed with joy. But joy is a tricky thing to pin down because as I, as we talked about it after she left, I said freedom like that would terrify some people. Like they would absolutely be paralyzed. Like where am I supposed to go? What am I supposed to do? Where are the parameters? Mm -hmm. and, and so what was joy for our, our sweet friend Bailey is not joy for certain other people. And you even said, well, isn't joy a warm puppy? And I was like, I mean, for a little bit. <laughs> And, and uh, until you have to take it outside at two in the morning. That's right. That's not joy anymore, as we're about to find out in our household. Um, so, so I think it's something that can be fluid and that can change over time. And we talked about the notion of what brings you joy changing mm -hmm. over time. Um, but you know, you asked why joy over anything else. Like, why, why not just sit in anger? And I think that's a little bit of what Jesus is is getting at in that section of the Sermon on the Mount. Like, really, you could live this way, or you could live this way. And so he's you, trying to, to show us something else. Yeah, so you could live with worry. Yes, indeed. Or live with hope. That's right. I think, you know, those are the, mm -hmm. the, the binaries that seem to be there in that passage. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, on that same theme, uh, you talked about uh, that nearly everybody's life is on a continuum, this is my interpretation of mm -hmm. what you said, between living in the middle of a crime scene mm -hmm. and perfection. Sure. <laughs> so can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so the, the way I presented it to Matt yesterday was that I, I feel like every, every person's life at some point is a crime scene. And so what do we do that gets us from the crime scene like what is the most responsible what is the most faithful maybe way to say all right this is what i have been dealt mm -hmm. and i'm working towards something else and so i think that's an equalizer are you asking me to speak from experience yeah, um like. you know we were we were fleshing this out in my own childhood um i was absent of a father figure and learning how to navigate that um, as a very small person is is quite challenging and I think where we landed was you can either become marked by that and say well I'm going to carry this for the rest of my life and experience mm -hmm. anger or fear or deep sadness or sorrow or grief or you can say over a period of time and with much help I, this is something that I'm going to own and then I'm going to step beyond it because there's more for me here um, mm -hmm. And so we talked a little bit about resilience and grit yeah. and how that's really a part of getting, getting to joy. Yeah. So we have a question for you. Mm. Would you like to ask it? <laughs> sure. Our first question there? Sure, yeah. The so first the question is, is joy a choice? Is it really a choice? Or is it simply an emotion that comes and goes? Or is it something that you can choose and hold on to? maybe more often in some situations than not. Yeah, so we'd like for you to take a couple minutes, turn to somebody near you or go to someone near you and ask, try and answer that question. Well, let's put, a, let's put the definition on top of it too. What is joy? Mm -hmm. And is choosing that, whatever you describe it is, is that a choice? Does that make sense? Give it a shot. <laughs> couple minutes. <laughs> all right. What have you, have you all figured it out? I think they've got it. What is joy? Okay, I don't have a, Mary Katie's using the handheld, so you have to speak up. Yes. Joy is a gift. 
a fleeting gift sometimes. Ah, a surprise fleeting gift. Or just a surprise. Yeah, I, I'm glad you said that. That made me think, when, right as you said it, I remembered a couple years ago I was in uh, Arizona. And I left early, early in the morning from my hotel so I could watch the sunrise uh, over the south rim of the Grand Canyon. Um, I was not the only one with that idea. There was a lot of people there. Um, and I did. I got to I watched the sunrise. And then I hiked down in the canyon, and I watched it rise again. And I went down further and watched it come up again. And like when you said joy is a surprise, I'm like, I had three or four sunrises that day before I gave up hiking down into the canyon when I remembered I had to come back out. <laughs> joy is a surprise and a, yes, and a gift. Any others? Joy is a, a wave. Sometimes it washes over you. And what was the last part? It pulls you under. Oh, joy is a wave. Sometimes it washes over you. Sometimes it pulls you under. Joy is an affirmation. An affirmation of the goodness of God. When you experience that, sometimes it's a warm inside. Yeah, so joy is an affirmation that mm-hmm. I think that's what you said of goodness and love. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Um, I understand that the people of Finland are the happiest people in the world of Sweden. Um, and uh, they don't have extra money, but they have joy. Mm. So uh, our happiness and also the joy of being part of that balance. Uh huh. So joy is a comes from a balance uh, and happiness as well. Any others? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. So, so joy is a, that sense of God's presence. Mm-hmm. I meant to bring with me this morning a, a book. It wasn't actually the one we were talking about. Um, but it is, it's, I think it's by Joy, that might not be the right first name, but the last name is Egan, Dr. Egan, E-G-A-N, I think that's right. Uh, she's a psychoanalyst who was uh, imprisoned at Auschwitz and writes now about, you know, finding joy in life and has a beautiful memoir. And I, I'll look it up as Mary Katie is uh, responding to all of your um, thoughts and so I can make sure you have the right one because it is it is an interesting way to view life and the world that we live in from the perspective of someone who very likely suffered through the worst that humanity has to offer Mm -hmm. Uh, any other thoughts yes sir you talked about uh, how joy has to be pursued Mm. Mm. Yeah, so joy is a, something that needs to be pursued, mm-hmm. uh, like weeds that come up after a good rain. <laughs> How do you respond to those thoughts? What do you, what, did that make you think of anything? Well, I think the common thread in so many of them is that it is at some level a choice, right? Mm-hmm. You have to choose to pursue, right? You have to choose to find that balance because that's a choice in the ordering of your day. Um, I think you have to choose to be alert to when it might come up. Right. Because I think sometimes, you know, we all walk around. Uh, I have a teenager who walks around like this. Right. <laughs> like and this. So, yeah, like exactly like that. That's a great example, Matt. I think yes. yeah. I've been practicing. Yeah, exactly. I, and, you know, I teach college students. After right, all, there so you go. I'm trying to connect. Um, but, you know, I feel like we do that, too. We do that very literally, but we also do it, do it quite figuratively where we're not 
as alert for those things that might come up. You know, I think someone mentioned spontaneous joy, which mm -hmm. was um, was really helpful too. That's that's the choice to see it. And as I think about Again, I, I learn much more from my active older adults' friends than they learn from me. But when I see them, what they're doing is they're receptive. They're just open to whatever relationships would come up. They're open to wherever they would find joy, right, in the garden. They're looking for it. And so it is, it is that choice, that balance. I really appreciate what you said about balance. Um, so I, I do think it's a choice. I, um, I think that relationships can't be underestimated in their connection to joy as well. Because I do believe we really need people with us. Um, my older daughter will, when she's looking up from her phone, will tell you that something I've always told her is that life is about relationships, relationships with God and relationships with other people. And I did not come up with that myself, but that was told to me as a child by Sue Henry. and. Um, she told me that every summer, again and again and again, and I found it very much to be true, mm -hmm. um, that life is about relationships with God and about relationships with other people, and it is so often through those relationships that we can really experience joy. Yeah. 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 So the, the book I was thinking of is called The Choice, um, and it's by Edith Egger. I mm -hmm. told you, I led you astray. It's Edith Egger, E-G-E-R, The Choice, Embrace the Possible. Mm. Um, definitely a, a book to recommend uh, to you on this topic. Yeah. Uh, she was a student of Viktor Frankl, if you're familiar with uh, Viktor Frankl's mm -hmm. work. So mm. the New York Times delivers, and they delivered for us. Uh-oh. Quite literally this morning. Quite literally this morning. Literally this morning. <laughs> we didn't even order it up. It just happened. Um, one of the essays uh, today in the New York Times is titled, There's a Specific Kind of Joy We've Been Missing. Mm -hmm. A specific kind of joy. Mm -hmm. uh, and the example that the, the writer Adam Grant gives right away is the, the first uh, concert in Madison Square Garden. The Foo Fighters gathered 15,000. You all know the Foo Fighters, right? Yeah. <laughs> 15,000 people all vaccinated together and they just had a big party, all right? And they just had a great time. And so uh, Dr. Grant, who wrote this article, um, writes this, and I found this very evocative for the, the talk we're having today. Peak happiness lies mostly in collective activity. <laughs> Peak happiness lies mostly in collective activity. And here's how that's described. We find our greatest bliss in moments of collective effervescence. Mm -hmm. Isn't that great? Collective effervescence, bubbliness. Mm -hmm. It's a concept coined by, in the early 20th century by the pioneering sociologist Emil Durkheim to describe the sense of energy and harmony people feel when they come together in a group around a shared purpose. Collective effervescence is the synchrony you feel when you slide into rhythm with strangers on a dance floor, mm -hmm. colleagues in a brainstorming session, cousins at a religious service, or teammates on a soccer field. And during this pandemic, it's been largely absent from our lives. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're rediscovering mm -hmm. this. Uh, I remember the first time in recent weeks where I walked into Home Depot and I forgot my mask. I didn't know about those people in there. <laughs> uh, but it felt like a little bit of a party. So, I mean, when I read this about collective effervescence and everyone was griping about the price of lumber, and we have a dear friend here today, Bill Pickup, who posts regularly on the price of lumber uh, <laughs> because he works with lumber. Um, but, I mean, it, all of a sudden, there's all these people there together again in each other's mm -hmm. space. Mm -hmm. And even in the Home Depot, where you're buying stuff to fix broken things, you know, my, that first experience for me of walking in there without a mask was like, this is kind of joyful. Yeah. <gasps> I've been vaccinated. Hopefully all these other people have been mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. I hope. Mm -hmm. um, so this, this notion of collective effervescence. That's great. 
So I don't attend your class at no, the YMCA. No, you should. Um, but, but you don't. I don't attend your class at the YMCA, but I hear it. <laughs> I hear it. Um, so I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot a little no, bit. No, I love it. Do you think you can do this? I do. Do you think you could lead us in a little bit? Oh, of... no. No. <laughs> 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 no, but we are, we are keyed up. We have a good time. All right. So how do you do it? We, how do you, you, know, how do you get those, all these people together in this joyful, I mean, everybody's working hard, but they, when I peek in, they love it. They look happy. Oh my goodness. They love it. But they love it because it's that collective effervescence, right? And I just, I love that term so much. I hadn't even read it until this morning, but it just reminds me of opening a bottle of something fizzy and it just, all the good stuff comes out yeah. and it just bubbles up and it's so great. But this group, um, you know, and I think I, I obviously see them in group fitness, but I think these groups are everywhere. Again, I think it's just that you have to look for them, right? Um, but they, they just so enjoy being in each other's presence. They enjoy just being known. Um, during the middle of class, we say, introduce yourself to someone you do not know, make them feel welcome. And they do. And I hear this of like, oh, I'm Diane. I'm Diane. I'm, you know, Tabitha or whatever, and they have the bop, 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 and so they all know each other now, and they've become this family, and I think that's what we missed before COVID, but I think COVID mm -hmm. really highlighted how much we really needed yeah. each other and needed those relationships and needed that joy, yeah. right? Just, just um, life can get so hard, and it can get so serious, and to have somewhere mm -hmm. where you can just laugh and be known and be fully known and loved and seen right where you are is just such a gift. I mean, there's, there's just nothing better yeah. than that, you know? And I extend that, that's our philosophy with children at our church too, is that every child will be seen, known, and loved. Somebody's going to give that child a hug today. Somebody's going to say, hey, Matt, I'm so glad you're here. It wouldn't be the same without you. Yeah. We love having you here. And, and look those children in the eye and make sure they know that someone is looking out for them. And that creates community. Mm -hmm. And that allows for that collective effervescence. Yeah. I think that's important. And, you know, it's not mm -hmm. uh, just to greet children, mm -hmm. you know, as human beings uh, with a joyful greeting and say, we're glad you're here. Mm -hmm. um, that's not always the case. Some children don't get that's that. Right. That's right. Uh, anywhere. Uh, and I'm, perhaps some of us are living in the shadow of that, right? Mm -hmm. You know, where mm -hmm. we didn't, or you didn't, or somebody you know didn't receive mm -hmm. that kind of affirmation as a child. Right. Uh, that <clears throat> I'm happy you're here, and I, I want you to be happy. I want you to be filled with joy. I want to mm -hmm. present to you opportunities to, to find and choose joy in your life. Uh, even as adults, right. it seems we're often not given opportunities mm -hmm. to do that mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, there's always something torturously drudgery work to do, right? Mm -hmm. That's going to occupy our time. Taxes. If you're self-employed four times a year, taxes. Um, work, mm -hmm. you know, that report that someone else should have written mm -hmm. but didn't and it still has to be done. Uh, you might not be a gardener. Myself, I'm not a gardener. I go after <clears throat> the garden with the, the weed eater um, and, you know, rented gas power tools. Yeah. Uh, true story. My wife is a, a gardener, and, um, you know, there's these plants that come up and there's flowers and it's all over the front of our house and it's quite lovely. I don't know what any of them are called. Um, <clears throat> she's like, smell this. I can't smell it. You know, it's a four o'clock. I accidentally called it an eight o'clock. And I saw this one in the, the middle of the thing, the garden area, and it was tall and it had like white flowers on the top, it looked like white flowers. Apparently they're seeds. I'm like, what is that? That's an interesting new flower I've never seen before. And she's like, that's a big carrot. <laughs> and I was surprisingly happy that there's a, a large carrot in the garden because I could cook that later, mm -hmm. you know. Um, mm -hmm. So even, you know, as adults, we have to, when mm -hmm. we talk about choosing joy, um, sometimes we have to seek it out mm -hmm. or we can't find it mm -hmm. because we're so covered up with the rest of life. Um, that same writer in the New York Times back in April 
wrote another article um, on languishing. That there's a, in uh, kind of cognitive psychology, there's a, uh, a range between depression, if you will, and flourishing, right? So if you're in severe depression, um, you know, seeing possibilities and hope and joy and love and happiness and all the bright, shiny lights of being alive, if you're in a depressed state, you just, you can't grasp hold of those. And that's why it's so difficult to help people break out of that. Uh, on the other end of that continuum is flourishing, you know, where you see life as it presents you all kinds of opportunities. It has challenges, but you have the resilience and the grit mm -hmm. and they're, you know, forging ahead. In the middle there is languishing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you just don't feel like you can get anything done. You're not depressed, but you're not flourishing either. You're just kind of eating crystal burgers all day long. I, I don't know why that came to my mind. <laughs> I, you know, perhaps when I think of eating crystal burgers, I, I think things have gone poorly that day. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Now I think differently about crystal. I love it. I'm open to a joyful reconsideration of crystal hamburgers. Of crystal hamburgers. I like it. <laughs> um, and I'm glad to know that because my mother-in-law's 80th birthday yes, it is. is coming up. Oh, an interesting uh, biographical note. Mary Katie's fourth grade, third grade, third teacher. grade teacher mm -hmm. is my mother-in-law. Amazing. It's the best. <clears throat> and at her birthday party, we're having sacks and sacks of crystal. And I've been the one selected to go pick them up. And no doubt I'll eat a few of them on the way <laughs> back to the uh, birthday celebration. Mm -hmm. So, Mary Katie, what do you, I mean, you have these students in your YMCA mm -hmm. class. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're engaging in this collective effervescence. You're making them mm. hurt um, because you're doing hurt. exercises and things like that. They love it. They love it. Um, how do you, I mean, just kind of a general population, mm -hmm. uh, how, do you, how would you help these folks yeah, uh, like find that as well? What's the takeaway? Yeah. I mean, what, what can we grasp hold of? Yeah, I think when we when we initially started talking about this, about how to find joy, you know, my five easy steps by 1030 so you can be joyful at the 11 o'clock service. Um, <laughs> when we first started talking about that, he said, well, why would you choose joy? And I said, well, why would you choose anything else? Like, it, it, it doesn't seem, you know, if you run a cost benefit analysis on this, it just does not seem to be the thing to choose. Like, you, you would absolutely choose joy every time rather than choosing to languish in something else. And I think, too, like that's, that's just God's best for us, that there is something that we can look for. Mm -hmm. um, C.S. Lewis wrote that joy is the serious business of heaven. And if joy is the serious business of heaven, if God takes joy that seriously, then shouldn't we try to find it? Because my, you know, I, the aerobics class is a great example. It's not for everybody, right? Not everyone's going to find joy there, but it might be in a garden, right? You're going to find joy on the elliptical. That's right. right. outside. Um, the elliptical, I can choose the resistance. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you're going to find joy somewhere. And I, I truly believe that everybody can find it somewhere. So how do we seek it? How are we open to it? I really appreciate what, what we said over here, that it is something that is available to us. Maybe not always in the biggest doses or the smallest doses, but... It is, it is there. And so how do, we, how do we gear our lives to where we're open for it? And I think so much of that is simply looking up, mm -hmm. right? Looking up at what? Mm, looking up for what God would have for us. You know, I told you this morning, I, um, I go for a walk or a run every morning. And this morning... It's annoying. Yeah. That's, <laughs> tell me how you really feel about it. Um, I mean, no. I'm challenged by it, right? <laughs> but really, this morning, I woke up and it was pouring down rain, right? And so I have choices. I can say, I hate the weather in Middle Tennessee. I'm going to pull the covers up over my head. And that's my choice to be angry. I can slam the cabinet doors in my house when I get coffee and I can let my entire family know how angry I am about the rain. I can be sad about it mm -hmm. and morose and kind of walk around with my head down. 
I can be fearful that I won't just get any exercise today and then I just, and we're just going to bomb this and it's going to be awful. Or I can say, well, I have an umbrella and I have a pair of old raining shoes and this is what I'm going to do. You know, I'm not going to let this ruin it. I'm going to forge ahead. And mm -hmm. I think that sometimes takes a little bit of creativity and grit and resilience, but I do believe it can be done. So I like what you just said. That made me think about, you know, how if we're, if joy is a choice, sometimes we have to be creative. Mm. Um, and that might be a good question. We have a second question for you. Mm. Um, yes. Oh. Please. Mm -hmm. Indeed. That's exactly right. And I think there are situations, and in those situations, where other emotions are perhaps more appropriate, right? Um, do you want to speak to no, that go ahead. anymore? No. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, do think, I do think that that's worth considering. And I think um, many of us feel very limited by those, um, by those parameters for sure, because I think that was kind of the something I mentioned at the very beginning, we all have them, mm -hmm. no matter what they are, right? We all have them and we have them in spades usually and we have different ones. So how do you find joy in those things? And I think it's a continual pursuit. And I think there are days where that's just not there. And that's okay too. Um, and we talked about the emotions of the movie in, Inside Out, yeah. where the emotion of the day could very well be sadness. And the emotion of the day could very well be anger. The emotion of the week could be anger. And anyone, I think anyone in this room or online or wherever you are could look back and say that year was tough. Yeah. Um, I remember a New Year's Eve in particular that was just bleak. Um, you know, like getting choked up, thinking about how awful that New Year's Eve was. Mm -hmm. um, for me, just feeling like I could not see, a, could not see a way beyond it. Um, and, and that there is a way beyond it because that's the God we serve, right? Yeah. That there is something else there. But I think there's absolutely an appropriateness in embracing other emotions with the idea that joy comes in the morning. Mm -hmm. And so we were, yesterday when we were talking, we landed on this notion of keeping watch. Mm. Uh, and the, the scriptural image that popped up was uh, Jesus and the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane. Are you familiar with this story? Uh, so the, the, Jesus and the disciples are in the garden, and Jesus wants to go pray. Mm. He feels led to pray, and his prayer is uh, not a prayer of joy. Yep, that's right. Uh, it's a prayer of, I don't want to face the challenge in front of me. I don't know how to face the challenge in mm -hmm. front of me. Take it away from me. I mean, it, if there's a, in the Gospels, if there's what sounds to me like a real human prayer of Jesus, mm -hmm. that's it. Yeah. I, I don't know what this future looks like. I don't want to choose this. Mm -hmm. Make it not a choice. Mm -hmm. Take it away. Take this cup away from me is the word. Jesus asked his disciples to do something very simple, to keep watch, to stay awake while he goes to pray. We're not really told why he tells them to keep watch or stay awake, um, but he tells them to do that anyway. Uh, of course, at the end of the story, Judas appears with um, the, soldiers. The, the people and the crowd and, mm -hmm. you know, everything else goes from there. Um, but he asked them to keep watch. And they didn't do it. I mean, one of the things we know about the disciples is they often weren't very good at doing what Jesus asked them to do. Um, they didn't listen very well. They didn't keep the watch. They did fall asleep. So he was asking them, why are you falling asleep? Why do you not keep the watch while I'm having this moment of doubt, real doubt, darkness, suffering. <clears throat> and what we talked about yesterday on that passage 
was that part of, when we think about joy as a collective experience, mm. uh, you know, also thinking about the question that you raised, you know, what about those times in people's lives when joy just seems like the, the emotion that's the farthest away? Mm -hmm. um, part of our responsibility in that collective choosing of joy is keeping the watch for those who can't. That's right. Um, when we're joyful to, even in our joy, to remember that there, there are those who aren't mm -hmm. and perhaps can't find joy. Um, one of the most powerful lessons I learned as a young pastor um, was that sometimes in the midst of those situations, you can't show up and start talking in the midst of people's pain, mm -hmm. uh, especially as a pastor. They really don't want your religious platitudes. That's right. But what works the most is presence. Mm -hmm. Being that rooted and grounded presence of something beyond the, the suffering and the mm -hmm. doubt and the darkness mm -hmm. that a person is experiencing mm -hmm. as representing that collective effervescence mm -hmm. that they know is there but seems so far away, yeah. keeping watch <clears throat> in the midst of their dark hour, mm -hmm. uh, just showing up is an expression of joy. Sure. Uh, so we had uh, a question that we wanted you to talk with each other about on that, kind of thinking about everything we've talked about. How, how is having that joyful presence a good way to keep watch mm -hmm. uh, in the present? Does that make sense? I don't think it does. I think we're thinking about joy. Because <laughs> I'm getting a light. <laughs> I think we're thinking about joy in community joy, yes, as well. You. That's why yeah. Mary Katie's here. <laughs> So ask well, I, the question in a more sensible way. I, I do think we're, we're talking about joy in community. So as we're, because I'm, I'm so glad for, for what you said in the back row, because I think that's worth, first of all, I think it's worth a distinction between joy and happiness or between joy and like happiness. You know, joy seems a little more rooted. It seems a little bit deeper. It sometimes seems a little more subtle. It doesn't seem surface to me. Um, so as, as you brought up what you brought up, I think that's really important, this notion, too, of keeping watch for our brothers and sisters. Because in a community of believers, we don't function as individuals, right? We're all, we're all in this together. A little high school musical nod for, for the person in here who's younger than 15. Um, <laughs> but I, I do think that part of living the Christian life is living it in community and not living it in a vacuum. And so when our brothers and sisters go through difficult times of trial, how do we keep watch for them? And how do we bring them the joy that is found in, the, in our faith? Yeah. Um, you know, without, as you said, kind of showing up and giving them some Christian platitude or right. telling them to cheer up, everything will be okay. Um, because that, that would be wholly inappropriate. Mm -hmm. So I think what we're getting at is what does it look like to keep watch for our brothers and sisters as the disciples kept watch for Je well or didn't should have done a better job yeah. keeping watch for jesus as he was in his hour of need what does it look like to keep watch with a spirit of joy in community see what does it look like for you to keep watch mm -hmm. over others in our mm -hmm. collective our community with a spirit of joy mm -hmm. so if you will Turn to someone near you and have that conversation for a few minutes. And we'll get some thoughts on that and wrap up. That's, and that's how I get my class together. I say, all right, well, I say, all right, friends, let's circle back. Um, so what does it look like to keep watch with the spirit of joy for our brothers and our sisters? What does that look like in community? Back row. Mm. I love that. So what I'm hearing, um, for those of you who, who might not be able to hear, is that presence is also key. But in addition to that, 
is prayer. And uh, I'm hearing individual prayer too. That, that you know, so much of this doesn't have to be overt, but it can it can be a petition between you and the Lord. Absolutely, on that person's behalf, intercessory prayer. Yeah. What else? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And maybe um, she said, "Focus on the feeling that you recognize that that person is having." But I think. I think also allowing space for that feeling, right? Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, th- I think allowing space is so key, right? I love that. Not she said, not criticizing, maybe not tampering things down. So I'm hearing availability, maybe, that there that it is important in those times to know that there are people to reach out to that are available, that are willing, um, that are receptive. And oh, that's great. I love that, the mutuality, right, of being in that kind of community, whereas I reach out to you, you're reaching out to me. That's lovely. Thank you. So enter into that relationship with them and talk to them. It's really good, too. Yeah. I think so much of that is the with, right? The presence. Being with someone, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. A little bit louder for the people in the back. She said, listening as well as talking. And that's the power of being with, too, is giving that space, right? Yeah, absolutely. Book recommendations galore today. Yes. Yeah. Now it should be on. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> like it doesn't sound like I'm on. Happiness is a choice you make. Thanks, Harper, sir. just one quick second. Right, you had a thought. I was just going to say, in addition to what everybody else has said. Mm. So much of that, too, sounds what you're saying, giving that gift of time seems to be allowing for the spirit to move, right, rather than confining. That's great. I love that. Harper, we'll let you offer the last thought. Okay? Yes. (sighs) All right. So look at that. We're out of time. No, just kidding. The, The question was the relationship between happiness and joy. What's happiness compared to joy? What's happiness compared to joy? That might be a, something to take away. It might be something to take away and kind of chew on, um, you know, as, as you, I was about to say, as you go out to lunch. Um, <laughs> but something to further think about. For me, I think joy is something that no one can take from you. There is, um, there is a continual 
kind of wellspring and search for joy. Happiness tends to be more fleeting, but I don't think that's bad. And I no. think that's probably a whole nother Sunday school lesson. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, yeah. Mary Katie, thank you for being with Absolutely. us today and uh, yeah. guiding us yeah. through the landscape of joy. Yeah. Um, we have two more weeks left in the summer series. Uh, next week, I'm going to ask you to do something entirely ununited Methodist, and that is if you have a Bible that you read from, bring it with you to church. <laughs> Or you can, I mean, I use my phone and an iPad as well. So if you have that, that's fine too. Because next week we're going to look into some of the passages in the New Testament uh, where Paul and others address um, hope and, you know, how they understood and approached hope in the moments they were experiencing. Mm -hmm. So if you feel like that's something you want to do to bring your Bible with you or to bring your digital device with a Bible on it with you, uh, let's do that. And we'll, we'll, we'll spend some time next week uh, looking at those passages and uh, kind of ferreting out the meanings we can find there. And then our final week, we'll have um, on the big screen here, uh, Dr. Tim Eberhardt, who is a professor of theology at Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary in Evanston, Illinois. Uh, he uh, is actually has a chair um, they're working on what's called ecological theology. So he's very interested in how communities can be agents of change uh, for the good of the world and the earth and communities. He sees ecology as a, a whole presence and not just a very narrow scope on something, for instance, like climate change. Uh, so he'll be here talking about uh, ecology and hope. Mm -hmm. So that'll be our, that's two Sundays from now. Again, next Sunday is, uh, we're going to be Bible studying away um, on, uh, in the New Testament and beyond. And I hope you take away from today uh, some thinking about how you're going to find and choose joy. Mm -hmm. Mary Katie, do you have any kind of one or two final thoughts you want to send people away with? Yeah, I think we kept circling back to joy and community and joy and relationships. And I do feel like so many of the things that I've heard from you all about joy have to deal with relationships with God. Like you mentioned, the importance of prayer. And I just think that's beautiful and so true. And the relationships we have with each other and how that, that mutuality that you mentioned, I just love that. So I'm very grateful um, for the way that this, this talk has really circled around to joy not being something you can achieve in three easy steps. Or, or five, um, even. Or, or five. Or, <laughs> or, or we pick up at Publix this afternoon, but something that's a little bit deeper that we can experience with one another and with God. All right. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. We'll be hanging around. If you want to hang around and chat for a little bit, we're happy to do that. But again, thank you uh, for your presence today, and go in peace. Thank <laughs> you.